I'm Dr. Norma Braun, Chairman of the Archives Committee of the Medical Board of Mount Sinai St. Luke's, Mount Sinai West, formerly Roosevelt. I'm also a senior attending and clinical professor of medicine at the Icon School of Medicine. We've begun the Oral History Project to record our illustrious alumni who have contributed so much to care at St. Luke's and to the world at large from the work that they have been doing uh, for their long careers. So today I'm so happy to introduce Dr. Peter Holt, who has been uh, a very sentinel part of our St. Luke's family and very active in gastroenterology. I will let him tell us about his career. So P Peter, we'd like to start with where you were born and how you came to be coming here through your education process and then finally arriving at St. Luke's. It's, it's a quite a long story. Oh, please. <coughs> All right. I was born in Berlin, Germany, um, of a um, middle-class Jewish family um, who were happily um, German until um, towards the middle of 1930s when things became a little uncomfortable. And they did so um, progressively. In fact, my first memory, true memory, um, was on November the 10th, 1938 when literally I and my mother went to get uh, a visa to go to England and we had to walk to the um, tram to go to the British Embassy and I could um, still feel the glass under my, under my feet because that was the morning after Kastallanacht. And that's really when my memory started. Anyway, that's one story. Um, my father and I got to England, my mother came a few months later, um, and um, I was um, thrown into an English school, not knowing any English, I uh, learnt, and a typical memory, if I may diverge, is sometime, let's say, months after I joined that school, um, I could suddenly put my hand up because the teacher had asked an, a question in arithmetics, arithmetic, so I could go up to the board and do the answer, but I couldn't answer it in English. But anyway, so I grew up in, um, in the outskirts of London, then came the Second World War, and um, sort of after most of the Blitz, um, my mother and I became camp followers, which meant my father was in the army, and so we followed wherever he was mm. much of the time. And then finally I sort of <coughs> started my schooling in a grammar school in, when I was about 12. And um, went to grammar school. Uh, in England you could go after your, your high school, grammar school, straight to medical school, which is what I did at the age of 19. Marla. Uh, graduated um, 1954, a long time ago. <laughs> and um, did my house jobs, my uh, in, uh, internship at um, the hospital, that, the university hospital that I was at. Uh, then we had to go in the army for two years. And somewhere in the middle of that, I decided that the <coughs> English system was, was, was still in the 30s, and you sort of <coughs> slowly walked your way up. And I thought, well, why don't I t come to the North America for, for a year? So most, <coughs> most English people would go to Canada, but I said, well, if I'm going to go for a year, I might as well get to the States, and if I'm going to go to the States, I might as well try to get to New York. Although what I then did, uh, this was in the spring of the year that I came to this country in 1957, um, I sort of applied. So what did I, who do I apply to? The Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, Johns Hopkins, Columbia Presbyterian, and so on. Of course, I got no answers from most places, except from Columbia Presbyterian, where the chair was a, is an Anglophile, was an Anglophile. And so he um, said, well, why don't you write to the New York Academy of Medicine? Just, they, they sometimes have residency positions open, which I did. And actually, he well, must have called them because I got a letter. There's this place in St. Luke's, um, which, of course, they didn't know anything about. And it was signed, uh, Dr. Coffin. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And when I came here, of course, it was Dr. Coffin, Dr. Diaz, 
dead teeth. So it was a, an unusual combination of names. Was that Jarvis Coffin? Uh, that was Jarvis Coffin. Yeah. 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 So um, then finally I stepped, uh, set foot in um, at St. Luke's for the first time on July 22nd, uh, 1957. 60 years ago. 60 years ago, that's right. So that's how I sort of came here. And uh, <clears throat> I was a resident in medicine. In the, those days, it, it was sort of interesting. Um, you know, now they have to work from a certain number of hours and, and have no time to do anything else. We, we were able to have um, two months off for, for research which I did with Bob Case. Um, yes, that paper, the paper, The Dying Heart. Um, and that was also the time which I swatted, if you know that English word, for the exams, because I had to take all my exams again. I took everything from anatomy, physiology, every single exam in New York State. And of course, I can't really practice anywhere except New York State, because that's the only exam I ever took here. So that, that, that was an interesting time at, 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 at St. Luke's. There were, there were six residents, I think. It, that was it. And we were on um, every second night, right? Yes. Oh, yes. Every That's other right. night, every other weekend. That was That's the, right. that was the uh, schedule. Mind you, mind you, the internship in, in London, I was on the whole time. We had no time off. Mm. <laughs> Unless you were sick. Mm. Anyway, St. Luke's then, um, it, it was, um, we, we were really, it was a remarkably friendly place. Um, I mean, the house staff was small, so you knew virtually everybody. Um, you, of course, would get together on, for Vespers on Friday afternoon at four or five. Um, and um, yes, it was. It was. Uh, you helped each other. You know, you were there to to um, a lot of com camaraderie. I, you me <coughs> you remember the, uh, the the house staff shows? Mm -hmm. they don't yes, occur indeed. Anymore. <laughs> <coughs> um, where my English accent would occasionally <laughs> sort of um, be out, be be encouraged to come out. Let's put it that way. Um, you, you entertained them. <laughs> you, oh yes, we did, we did, by Jove. <laughs> yeah, well, how it. then did you get into gastroenterology? Um, pardon me. I was, became interested in gastroenterology as a medical student <coughs> because um, the, the, uh, um, the chair, the consultant, uh, in, in, in England, you're attached to two consultants in medicine, two in surgery, usually, when you're there. Um, and the consultants was, um, was interested in sort of mind-body. And so he got all the ulcers. Um, and there were a lot of ulcers. So I got interested in that and then continued to have an interest as a house officer. Um, and in fact, What's probably the <coughs> best um, piece of clinical research I ever did, which was done during my residency here, was the, the thought was initiated by observations, by talking to patients, and I noticed that um, <coughs> a, a, a oh, fair number of patients who um, were admitted bleeding from their ulcers had taken aspirin. So that stuck with me, um, and then again, what we were allowed to do more research in oh, one month. And in a month, uh, for $100, which was spent on getting co chromium-51 um, to label red cells, um, I did a study with 24, 25 patients um, who were given aspirin, and I took the, their stools and ground them up and studied the, the loss of 
the chromium 51 as a reflection of red so and um, uh, that whole study was done in one month mm. and um, was written up about a year and a half later and actually <coughs> Dick Pearson whom I'm sure you'll interview at one point will uh, will say that that sort of got him into nuclear medicine because <laughs> he followed up that with a number of other studies <coughs> <coughs> what was interesting what was interesting is how much time <coughs> we were given to what I call play. In other words, <coughs> I took two months at the East Orange VA Hospital um, doing gastroenterology because I really wanted to find out what it was like. And, um, and they had a very good gastroenterologist there. Um, uh, and um, it was another two months. So that, that the ability, as I would say, to play, uh, which is what I always call, or I used to say to fellows in gastroenterology, this is the one time in your life that you can, you know, you can find your way, you can play, you can try something. It doesn't work, you can go to something else. And that, I think, was present even at, during residency here, which was really quite remarkable. It, it allowed you to flourish, to fly a little bit, you know. Well, I know that Dr. Keating's, one of his main goals was to introduce the concept of research early on in yes. the training of the residents here at this hospital. And, and he went to a great deal of effort to right. assure that. And one of the reasons Dr. Van Italy was recruited to come right, here. Right, right, right. So that, that was... Of course, the, I, I was, Ted came after Right. My, my residency. Uh, but yes, um, it, it, it was quite remarkable. And it's still a lesson, although life's different these days. Yeah, well, then you spread out to um, uh, lipid research. Yes. Um, and so how did, how did that leap occur? Well, um, <coughs> I went, um, when, when I um, decided to go into GI, uh, I sort of took a trip around, uh, across the country, which was wonderful in its own right, um, uh, and sort of looked at various places uh, to do a fellowship, and, um, uh, and fortunately um, ended at the Mass General in Boston um, with um, a remarkable <coughs> mentor who was about three years older than I was, <laughs> um, who had been DNIH, uh, Kurt Isselbacher. And he, he brought biochemistry into gastroenterology, basically. Um, and so in there, I was, uh, the, the research I did, uh, amongst others, was um, to, uh, to study the effect of fat on the intestine uh, into, into a number of the biochemical features of the intestine. This is in the rat in, the rat in those days. Um, and. Um, that really got me into lipids, but the, 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 that was another period in which I could play. I, 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 and, and, and so it's interesting. It, I, I made um, something that allowed one to, to measure a protein losing enteropathy, the loss of protein through the gut um, the wrong way, and re resulting in hypoalbuminemia. And so I did studies there in at the at the children's, um, at a number of uh, ho hospitals, and, and was able to do grand rounds as a fellow in four different university hospitals while I was a fellow, you know. I mean, it, again, it was different. Um, and, and I think I, I was always inquisitive, so I could, <laughs> I found my way to do things. I mean, I, wh when I came here in, in, as a chief of GI, I'll tell you in a minute, um, I initiated immediately a med medical surgical GI conference. And the reason was because that's what I experienced up there, though at least that's where I went to. And I was with the you know, most senior uh, surgeons uh, at Harvard arguing, the only medical person arguing <laughs> something, you know, and able to, to interact and, and, and you know, obviously learned an incredible amount in that process. So again, a different time. So, um, 
I, when, I, when I went into gastroenterology, I assumed I was going to be a practitioner of gastroenterology. Um, uh, and I was offered a chance to go to Sinai and so forth. But um, then Ted Van Italy said, well, quite quote unquote, why don't you start a division of gastroenterology? Yeah, because there wasn't any. Right. <laughs> So well, that was also uh, Keating's view that we should develop expertise in subspecialties right. in medicine. So right. that was Ted's charge, uh, which then allowed this to go forth. Yes, and it was a, a, a wonderful time. I mean, um, <coughs> what 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 did it mean to be a chief of gastroenterology here? It uh, it meant that I saw all the patients, I did all the teaching, and I did all the research all simultaneously. <laughs> That's what it meant. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of work. <laughs> a lot of work. Um, and, uh, but, you know, it's, you, you both learned and um, we were able to um, find other people who enjoyed that. Um, I mean, my first so-called fellow was actually a chief resident uh, who had enough time out of his chief residency um, to do a couple of research projects, one of which was published in the Journal of Clinical Investigation. You know, um, again, different time, um, and it was fun. It was—I uh, mean, it was hard work, <laughs> but it, it was—it was fun. And so, is uh, that when you began to recruit other uh, attendings? Yes, I mean, what <coughs> we were fortunate enough. Uh, Charles Flood, Charlie Flood, uh, was a wonderful gastroenterologist, wonderful human being at Columbia Presbyterian, um, and. So he was kind enough to come down. At least he was. He would do um, uh, semi-rigid, uh, semi-flexible endoscopy in the side room of Stuyvesant Four, mm. um, and he would um, at least he, you you know he he would be there to 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 to, to give some advice from time to time. Even though his primary position is was a Columbia Presbyterian, he was just giving his time to. To, to to us and to me, so that really was the first. And I mean, uh, Miles Schwartz, when I came here, said, "We don't need gastroenterology. Any internist can do any anything that gastroenterologists can do." He d he didn't sounds like Miles. <laughs> yeah, but, but he just he didn't foresee endoscopy. I think you know, which uh, was uh, was just about starting. Um, uh, in the early 60s, mid 60s, um, and I think the the most important recruit that I made was uh, Dick McRae, uh, who came here as a, a, a resident, an internal resident in 62, and um, sort of said he was interested in gastroenterology. So off he went to Boston and um, came back and. So we started the first endoscopy unit in, in, in New York City, um, uh, which kept him, kept him there for the next 30 years. Um, we, um, we, ha we recruited volunteers, we recruited one hepatologist for a while. Um, but at, at first, I think we, did, we had residents uh, who, who would would stay and do some fellowship. Then I got um, the first one, I think, David Chalfin, who, um, and I, I, I presume, I can't remember now, that Ted got the money for fellowship, although I think David got a, an NIH fellowship. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he was, I think, 1964. Um, Steve Mizze, uh, who uh, was a fellow for three years and did some nice research and ended up as a as a head of uh, hepatology at Johns Hopkins some many years later. So it was really through the fellowships that, that we, we developed and then the attendings were, became interested because they had a, some decent people to, to train. And then uh, we actually we, we got the uh, NIH um, training program for Columbia and I was the PI because there were no, really no gastroenterologists up at Columbia Presbyterian. Um, Stan Bradley, who was a, who was a hepatologist. Hep uh, well, he was a yeah, re renal man, Re-renal, really. renal, re renal and, hepatologist. Um, he was interested in the ascites, so he, he, he that meant he was supposed to be a hepatologist. 
and um, and you know and that, that was all they had. So so we got for nine years we had, were the site for the NIH training program in gastroenterology, and that was a we tremendously expanded our program here uh, with people coming, North Rosenzweig, and a number of people started to come. So it was a slow but steady process. Um, Ted, Ted Van Italy was crucial in supporting all of this, but he basically let us do, let us fly. Um, he was there to help, to help if you ask, but he never intruded himself. And, and I suppose I had sort of studied naivety, as I call it, and, and naively managed to, you know, get, get the division to get bigger. And it was, um, in the in the sixties and seventies, it was as, as good as any division in New York City. I right. think. You know. What what was the relationship that you had too with the nursing staff, the the non professional hospital staff, and all the things that happened between? Because they're the supporting oh, yeah. people. Well, I, I, <laughs> it, it was it was it was very close, but it was also. I would say a little, a little English, and I, <clears throat> again, I'll tell you a story. Um, when I came here as a as a resident initially, um, we, we were uh, some of the medical beds were um, on the second floor, Muhlenberg two, mm -hmm. yeah, in two, <coughs> and the head nurse was a, a surgical head nurse. Bot uh, uh, Bottinger, you, I don't remember, and she was, you know, she was a terror for, for the surgical residents. So anyway, um, the first day I w did rounds, um, she was sitting at the desk, and so I went over and said, are you ill? And she said, what do you mean? Well, you must be ill because you haven't joined our rounds. <laughs> Big about and she came, and she always came afterwards. It was not normal for the head nurse to come around. But, you know, my training said it was crucial to have that interaction between what the nurse saw and what we saw. Well, I've been trying to get that back here <laughs> for the last 10 years, because they miss so much because of the lack of it, communication. Yes, yes. Um, it's, they, they're, Separate estates, as you might say, these yeah, days. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> and it should be one. So, <coughs> I think um, certainly, um, I, I, in far as the endoscopy unit is concerned, it, we were all a big family. Uh, it, almost everything that was decided was decided with with knowledge on each side, uh, one way or the other, um, and it. it, it I agree. We we lost a lot from from not continuing to. And I probably was one of the last attendings on medicine who would always go to the bedside. I mean, you know, so many of the rounds now. Well, used to be when when I was still around uh, 15 years ago, um, was 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 made in the in the side room, looking at the computer. You know. Right. We switch from three dimensions to two. two. <laughs> Somehow we think that's progress, that's but wonderful. so yeah, it is. Yeah, that's so how, how did you intertwine your family life with this hectic schedule? Um, and what was its impact? Well, not all the, to be honest, not all the impact was perfect. Um, uh, the, um, but I, because I, uh, I did, go through a divorce, which mm. wasn't St. Luke's fault, it wasn't even all the work for, but it didn't help, you know. The needs of my ex-wife um, were not, um, could not be satisfied with the sort of life that I had to leave, uh, uh, that I had to live uh, and, and, and work for it. Uh, my kids, um, we spent a lot of time, um, but again, mm, I think there are some regrets. 
I, I do think that um, academic medicine, at least the way I uh, experienced it, and presumably my own personality, um, takes an enormous toll out of the family. It really does. Um, and um, it, 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 it took, well, it took finding the right person in the end. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I think that right person, at least for me in, the, as, in my role as, a, as an academic uh, uh, teacher, researcher, even later, um, was that she was also, she knew about academics, she was an academic herself in a totally different field. And so there was a part of life that each of us put a lot of effort into, and the rest we could get together, understanding that time and not being envious of the time, you know, which, which is what, what destroys a lot of families in, when, when one or the other. <laughs> well, when especially the when the children are small. Yeah. Because yeah. they're yeah. more demanding. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, what, yes, what do your children wind up doing? Yeah. Do so they follow a course in medicine or they do something else? What, what do your children do? None of them in medicine. Um, my, my son uh, is uh, in business, uh, basically in, in the developing or the associate computer back, back story uh, part of, of business. Uh, my older daughter is in the food business as, as, a, as a consultant rather. Well, she, she had a number of good positions, but then she ended up being a consultant, which doesn't please me too much. It isn't exactly, you know, safe, but she's managing. And my younger daughter has done extraordinarily well and um, is uh, na nationally known now. And she, she manages quite, quite well uh, in, uh, in business. Uh, is she's, she's in Uber. <laughs> she um, she runs North America for Uber. Um, but again, her, her husband is um, got his own political life, um, and um, they manage very well, you know. But it's it's personality. It's a balance. <laughs> yeah, no, th th there's no question. Uh, w did you have any role models in school, either in England or here in, in the United States? Did they uh, support you in any particular way? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I've, I've asked myself that, and the answer, I think, is really no. Uh, not not as, a, as a person. If, if anything, um, no. Um, why no? Uh, you know, the, my background made me have to sort of stand on my own feet pretty early. My father was in the army during six years during the war. I'm the only child. We were, you know, in bombed London and so forth. Um, my mother was very, very sensible because she didn't keep me close to her breast. So uh, she pushed me out to become independent. I think that independence almost um, you made it more difficult to, to accept some individual role model. I certainly didn't have a role model in my family. For one thing, my family spread all over the place. Uh, uh, mm. So um, <coughs> my immediate family, my father was in the army. And, um, so there, was a, there, 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 there wasn't time to get a role model. And at school, I didn't have one. At medical school, there was no one no single individual. So I think maybe I took little pieces of a different people and, and, and different people and, and integrated into my sort of personality and um, my tough personality. <laughs> well, and people know that. The, the reputation that I have of you is that meticulous attention to detail and no fooling around was, no fooling around. was, was, right. was sort of the sense that I got. Yeah. Um, but there's I, yeah. And as a teacher, I, I always felt that I, um, it was for me to push people just a little further than they thought they could go. Uh, and and the, the inner delight that, some, that most of them had when they actually found themselves going further, it, it was worth it all. 
Um, it's, very, it's very interesting. As you know, uh, Richard McRae died recently. And mm -hmm. so I had to think quite often about our very differing personalities mm -hmm. and, um, and, and how, how they worked. And, and, and I think for the fellows, it, it was perfect because I could be the tough, tough guy um, pushing and Dick could be the, you know, could be the outgoing uh, kids uh, pulling people in, putting their, his hands around their shoulder and, um, and um, making them feel that they're better than anyone else in the world, you know. And so it, it was interesting. Yeah, and no, I, he, and I, he I recognized, had that touch. I actually recognized it and I thought it was very good. And mm -hmm. it, 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 it was a, a good marriage in terms of, it, of teaching and, 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 and de developing people. Right. Yeah. So what led to your decision to retire in 2000 from these clinical responsibilities? Because obviously you were still very interested in doing other things. Yeah. So was it anything to do with uh, the mergers going on or, or personalities or change in funding? Because gastroenterology has exponentially expanded as a field throughout the world. So it's not because of a lack of things to do or a lack of research opportunities. Um, I actually, the, the most um, expansive time in the division, as far as research was concerned, was in the 1990s. And that was um, because we <coughs> first recruited um, uh, Steve Moss, who was um, from England, who had been at the, uh, the, the equivalent of the NIH in England, um, who then through the fellowship and stayed here for a while and now is professor of medicine at Brown. And then I got two, s separately, two Israeli um, fellows or people who had already finished their fellowship um, to come and work <coughs> partly with me and partly with um, uh, Weinstein, uh, Weinstein up, uptown. And we, that, in, those, in that period of time, we did a lot of research work. It was just you know, the, the, whole, the whole group. It was a, it was a, it was a nice group of people. Um, Do you think size makes a difference? I think yes, it does. When you, you have uh, you, the, the critical mass is sort of important. If you really want things to explode, even a small small explosion, um, and that's what we had, uh, and, and real interaction. Um, and then uh, they, they went home. Steve left about that time, but I had just. I mean, I was chief when I left it was 39 years and <clears throat> what I sort of decided was um, okay I've done it <laughs> and we've gone through the period and what would I like to do uh, I, we had labs uh, still uh, I mean wet labs that is research labs and um, and doing cl uh, clinical translational research and what I decided is what I wanted to do was just clinical translational research so having decided that, I sort of put out um, messages that I was interested in. And um, so when, then I got a position at the American Health Foundation who wanted to do, who was a, a very good organization, um, about 150 researchers uh, up at Valhalla and um, was, a, an NI, uh, was one of the first, uh, when Nixon's, um, one of his first um, uh, research uh, centers, uh, NIH research centers, the only one for prevention. And I've become interested in, in colorectal cancer prevention. Um, and so they wanted to develop a, a, their, their translational program. They didn't have much. And so that's where I went there. Uh, unfortunately, after about three and a half, four years there, they went bankrupt because oh. they spent too much money. I, I've never heard of a, a, a foundation going bankrupt, but 
they apparently spent the NIH money before they had the money. So, um, and uh, and then so then I went to the Strand Cancer Prevention Program here as head of the Colorectal Cancer Prevention Program, which allowed me to do research. Um, there was a, they actually had a lab at Rockefeller and then uh, Rockefeller University, um, and then. Um, there, there, we got some grants uh, um, for doing work in humans um, to do with um, calcium and vitamin D and, uh, and, and trying to understand the, the mechanism of if these work as preventives for colorectal cancer, try to um, understand the mechanisms involved. And in essence, what we, um, what we started then is really the, the concept I've continued to have, which is that people, first of all, only do small numbers of subjects rather than large numbers of subjects, and then use the subject as his or her own control. And so would, and, and so the concept for all those studies since then is um, you, you study the person at baseline you do the intervention, you wait till when you think the intervention has worked, and then you do the studies again in each individual subject. And the studies in those days were done on the colon, so we would take biopsies and then examine them histologically, biochemically, and molecular biology, and see what changed. Uh, and if you kept the subjects in, in often kept them in the hospital, at, at the Rockefeller, that's how I got to the Rockefeller, and I'll tell you more in a minute. Um, if you kept them like in cotton and without outside uh, uh, events as little, as little as possible, then the change you could examine and say, well, this change is most likely due to the intervention because nothing else changed. And so that's the concept. So I started that um, for one NIH study in 2003, and so I got on the adjunct faculty at, at, at Rockefeller, um, and then um, and then continued. They w they liked the fact I could bring subjects into their embeds and continued, and then uh, until 2007, and and then they they actually went on to the faculty, which is a little unusual with gray hairs over there, uh, but I. I, I became accepted. It takes time with the Rockefeller to become accepted. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. It's, a, it's, um, it's its own club. Yes. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've tried to sort of pull some of them kicking and screaming out of <laughs> the club and into the real world. Uh, but I think one of the things that not only my research there, but one of the things is that I did, I was able to because I knew so many so people and so, so much in general and, and much of the work at the Rockefeller is rather narrow so that they, want, they wanted that as well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I, for example, I head the, 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 um, uh, the committee that oversees all the clinical research programs mm. uh, in a, in a, uh, at the Rockefeller uh, for that reason. So uh, yes, then I came on, on the faculty there. Um, which is, you know, which, which has kept my, my mind, <laughs> the environment Bus has kept my busy. mind going. <laughs> but <laughs> <Yeah>. how? <laughs> and it's, just, uh, it's just extraordinary. And as I always say, I, I walk to um, the Rockefeller from the west side about two and a quarter miles in the morning, virtually every morning unless the weather is impossible. Um, and I walk with a, a spry, sp sp my spry feet because it's so good to be kind of going somewhere where one can enjoy <laughs> what one is doing. We can look forward to it. And look forward to yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah. That's grand. Yeah. That's grand. Yeah. Did the uh, merger in 79 with Roosevelt alter the program or your a vision of what would happen to GI? And um, then what happened when Beth Israel came on board? It took, um, I think it took for most divisions of uh, specialty divisions in medicine quite a long time before there was any real um, integration. Um, Alatia was running a good division. 
we, um, you know, we got on well. Um, uh, but it, it, I think we didn't really integrate for eight years, something like mm. that. So six or eight years. Um, we would have joint conferences, but, but real integration would came later and until it became a, a single program. Um, I just, I had no desire to expand <laughs> for the sake of expansion. I thought the program was good and an excellent clinical program. We, we offered some, I think some people did, did some research up here, um, as I recall, but, but, but not, but that's because they wanted to mm -hmm. rather than we forced it. Um, and it took quite a few years, around six, eight years, I think, before we really integrated. And I still, and Al still was site chief and crucial and, you know, it, it as I say, uh, you, 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 you make the very best with what you have and when it's pretty good, then it can only get better. <laughs> so that was my attitude. Did the changing chiefs of uh, medicine, medicine alter this relationship? Well, yes. Um, I mean, I think that, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm very independent personalities, I think you know. Mm. <laughs> That's where you started. <laughs> and um, so some, some chiefs, uh, I think, accepted or even liked that independence. I think others were not so sure about that. Mm, right, <laughs> right, right, right. Um, you were, were you then officially gone with the continuum um, establishment when we joined yeah. with BI? Well, no, well, I was never, we were never integrated. BI had its own program. Right. It's and, still, it's uh, still well, during my time, and again, they had a very good clinical program. Uh, you know, I would, I knew them all, and, and it was a good program. Um, but it really didn't in my time. Um, so, <coughs> I think you, my my view was not ex expanding it. It was mm -hmm. to to make everything better. That's fine. Uh, you know. Well, what again, what was something it, throughout your career that was the most catastrophic or, or negative it, that you could see and were you able to circumvent it or overcome it? Because things happen all the time. It's the interesting most question. difficult events, yeah. yeah. What was the most devastating? It's an interesting question. Mm. Well, I don't. I, I, I think I, 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 I'm looking at my, let's say my relationship with with uh, Columbia, you know, TN, Columbia University, um, which was, I mean, I, there I was head of the tr the. NIH training program in the 60s and, uh, and the first half of the 70s and then um, and I was one of the uh, really crucially in developing all of the teaching in uh, abnormal human biology at Columbia and so forth um, because we were a small group and we did a fantastic job. We, we made more gastroenterologists with that course than than anything else, I think. Um, so uh, it came uh, the late 70s for a particular uh, chief of GI that um, I was no longer uh, no longer were interested. Mm. But that that I don't know. It's devastating. But if I, uh, I look back and I, I was that was a disappointment. Here at, at, at <coughs> I mean at St. Luke's, um, 
I was fortunate enough to continue to have, we got NIH training program in, um, uh, in gastroenterology in, in geriatrics for five years from the NIH in the uh, early, in the late 80s and 90s. I was thinking, where did the money come from for the fellows? Uh, so it was, that was, you know, some of the struggles from time to time. Um, I did get um, some foundation grants um, for the training program because <coughs> more and more, as you well know, I think um, the institution was cherry of, of spending money on fellowship programs as a whole. Uh, they, they, they needed, um, they needed endoscopic help in gastroenterology. But once they got that, beyond that, it became less important than it was in the 60s. Um, so I think it was, you know, those were more difficult times. Um, but it's interesting, I, I, I can't see, I know some personal problems, but rather than professional mm -hmm, problems mm -hmm. that were, you know, mm -hmm. were very difficult. Um, well, the average uh, house staff now has a large debt, education yes, debt. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know how much of that was a limiting factor to training and to people you could select uh, for your training program. Uh, all those things obviously govern the regular life that people lead. They make choices uh, for their careers based on the ability to pay their debts because that, that's the potential. Well, the advantage of gastroenterology, of course, is that they, they have a, some procedures which pay well, and so clearly, I mean, for the last 15 years of being chief here, uh, every fellow who left here the first year would make more more money than I was. <laughs> so as chief, <laughs> as chief, <laughs> um, you know, I always say that Ted Ted Van Italy's view of an academic uh, uh, place, an academic environment was uh, how little you could pay and get away with it. If you paid little, then you were a very fine academic institution. <laughs> what a way to curry uh, well, prestige. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, uh, he did it, I mean, uh, you know, single-handedly. I mean, we can go back and, you know, you're right, all those people who who were recruited, um, it, 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 he, he produced a, a remarkable division in the 60s um, and uh, did it almost single-handedly and I don't know where he got the money from, but he did. <laughs> um, did you, you mentioned the, uh, the house staff skits, were you ever involved in them or d were you pilloried in them? <laughs> um, no, I was involved um, uh, around, <coughs> uh, when I was on the house staff, around the world in 80 minutes we put together um, and um, uh, but I w once I was on the faculty I think I left it to and I'm trying to remember there was one house to you you'll know it's your time uh, house staff who was superb at putting together uh, the uh, the house staff skits what was his name I can see him but I can't remember his name ended up in New Jersey um, but um, Yes, it was. Yeah, I mean, it remember. was so. It was so. It brought the, the faculty and, and and the house staff together, because we could laugh. We could yeah. laugh at each other. Right. I mean, you know, what what better to 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 develop a relationship than the ability to 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 laugh together, laugh at each other, and not feel bad about it. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, well, there were always two, uh, Department of Medicine, two house staff events a year. One was the Christmas party, right. and one was the June picnic, pic right. oh, that's in right. which that's right. the graduating house staff right. was there, and then the incoming new interns would meet for the first time right. and create the, I, I think it was the beginning of the collegiality right. Right. Uh, in their training, which is uh, a no longer uh, yeah, a tradition. So I that make, make, makes such a difference. Yeah, it's, uh, it's all circumscribed little fiefdoms, um, even at the house staff level, I think. Um, but anyway, it's been a long time. I mean, you know, 
uh, I, I can't even realize that it's 17 years since I stepped down. I mean, I would come for um, to, t to participate in some teaching on Tuesday mornings. That was regular. And I did it until two years ago when uh, um, we, we used to have two conferences. We used to have Grand Rounds and then another conference, which was um, Journal Club or, or uh, some specific topic, which I would run. So for two hours, I would spend uh, an hour and a half either getting, getting here and then going back to Rockefeller. Um, but then they reduced it to one hour. And I, c I, I could no longer justify spending an hour and a half for one hour. And mm. that, that, and then I stopped. So, so that's why um, I thought last night when I was at the, uh, the graduating GI Fellows um, party, I said this will be my last time mm -hmm. because it's in inappropriate for me just to appear <laughs> because nobody, w none of the fellows would know me, mm -hmm. and they still did yesterday. So it was a, it was a sort of um, almost a little uh, emotional sort of event because I started the <laughs> the graduating fellows party, of course, <laughs> in the sixties. So. Right, right. <laughs> Um, so it's a tradition. Yeah, and so yeah. this is really, I think, you know, I mean, it's not, it's not. I'm not cutting off my ties, but it's not very likely that I'll spend too much time anymore at, at St. Luke's. I, I can't say Mount Sinai, St. Luke's. <laughs> I can't I say that. Yet. I understand. I um, understand. And uh, I, 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 I uh, with, I'm sure you've had other people talk about. Uh, amalgamation and you know the, the, the mergers, big hospital yes. merges and so forth and I don't think um, it's it's necessarily <coughs> improved the relationships between people at those institutions let's put it that way um, I don't know if it produced any better care either but but I well, there's some outside. there's a different kind of pressure on house staff now too and I know that one of the residents was expressing his regret that he's losing his clinical skills because he no longer examines patients. And that, to me, is a terrible statement to make. But at any rate, of, of, um, the old, you've been here 60 years, so you've seen a lot of changes. And how much of the changes are extrinsic and how much of the changes are intrinsic? Um, but change is like a given. So how do we, you survive that because of your independence and flexibility. But um, obviously there's some feeling of loss. Yes. And there's a feeling of, of, of loss, not f for me. It, uh, I feel for the loss that the residents and fellows are enduring because Again, as I think I said earlier, to my mind, you've got to be able to play. You've got to be able to try things and feel your way rather than in doing training, both residency, although it's more difficult than residency, but you can do something. A and certainly doing fellowship. You have to, and, and, you, and, and research, what is research? Why, why did I always require research? It's, as I said, because you, whatever you do, you will know more about that little subject than 99.9% .9 of the rest of the world. And so, A, that makes you feel good, and B, you, if, if you can keep, you can potentially keep it up. You can sort of, because you know more about it, you're more interested, you're, and so you keep up. And in keeping up, even with a tiny piece of, of the, your, your academic world, it pulls, it pulls you along. So that's, that's to me what, why everyone should do some research. And, you, and, and as research is playing, I, I don't mean, it's not just research, it's, it's, it's not just research that I mean by playing. You can try, you know, different 
parts of your of the specialty uh, that you're in, or poison parts of medicine, and 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 see how how it, attractive it is for you as an individual. That's what I mean by pain. And um, and and just like experiences outside our academic world, you know, you, you, your experiences in traveling or in, in people. Um, make you a more interesting individual, make you more, um, your brain, your, your broadens your experience, it makes you more open by doing mm -hmm. those things. In, 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 in life as a whole, it's the same thing in mm -hmm. and, and, and it should, it should be encouraged and stimulated somehow, I think, to, to continue to make good doctors, you know. That's the bottom line. <laughs> so, did you have time for hobbies with all of this? Um, well, I, I, I love, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a city boy. I grew up, I, I was born in one city, I grew up in London, another city. And I grew up for a while in Paris and New York, and like the other than three years in Boston, or two and a half years in Boston. So I like the city things, the, you know, the, the arts, all this stuff. Um, I, um, I, I love walking. Hiking, still we did still did good hiking a couple of years ago. Uh, I mean through the Thor Mountains. I'm not sure I can do it quite as well now. Um, uh, I did some sailing, played some tennis, um, so I I a number of things. But no, no single, um, no single thing that 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 I couldn't live without. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. I mean, you know the. We, we are married to the profession as well as <laughs> to whoever else. <laughs> um, and it's still, it's still exciting. And, um, and science is still, and what, what, you know, what, the, what is happening um, scientifically in the world now, the, the pace is, is so extraordinary that, you know, it's exciting just to, to see it happen and to catch a little piece of it you know, fly with it. <laughs> right, and of course you maintain good health, which allows you to do uh, all these yes, things. Yes, yes, yes. And to yeah. what would you ascribe that? Uh, well, first of all, luck, I think. <laughs> um, I suppose genes. Now, uh, well, my, my father's uh, family were fairly long-lived. My father died at 81, but a lot of them reached their 90s. Uh, the, those that weren't um, whose life wasn't cut short um, in I Germany. Um, that's one. And I, you know, I think I, <coughs> I don't have t a lot of bad habits. <laughs> that helps. Um, good health. Some of it is luck. I mean, you know, we, will, we all have something, things. That, mm. and, and I think also an attitude. If I, I've had a, a certain number of things that had to be dealt with, and they just have to be dealt with. So that's part of life of my personality. I, shouldn't, I don't fuss about them. Mm. I mm. got good advice, and still, I hope, getting good advice. Because um, people always ask me, how do you find a good doctor? How do you find a good doctor? <laughs> <laughs> the most difficult is to find a good internist. Nowadays. Nowadays. Yeah, true. Uh, that's very difficult. So, I have. You mean you don't like gatekeepers? <laughs> well, I have a young gatekeeper, relatively young. I mean, everyone is young for me, <laughs> fair to me. Um, uh, he's probably in his uh, mid thirties or so uh, at uh, New York Hospital, and he's he's fine. I mean, you know, <clears throat> but but you know, as a physician, uh, as long as you're honest, you know, with, with your doctor. Um, then, then you you play an important role in your good health, and then you go to specialists, and it's very difficult, right? I mean, I I had major back surgery um, a year ago. Went to New York Hospital, and um, <coughs> it, you know it's got a tremendously wonderful reputation. Went because I lost the use of my leg, and went to actually a neurosurgeon uh, part of that spine surgery. And talk about medical care. I mean, he was he was fine. I mean, I saw him about twice, 
you know, I think I saw him once before, once after the surgery, and once in the follow-up. But the house staff, I never saw. Mm. Um, because what they knew about me was on the computer. Mm. So the computer treated me. I mean, uh, I, mean I ended up with, with um, a bladder full of fluid, 1,200 cc's, so I had to you know, find out myself. And, Go to, uh, left the hospital, went to urologist. I mean, it was it was incredible. So, I, and then and, and it, it reflects what you were talking about before, which is, um, it, it just, it, it's it's done by numbers, at least in the subspecialties like that. In fact, I was told because I said, you know, I I really need, I was obstipated too. I, you know, I had taken narcotics before the right. surgery because I was in tremendous pain. Um, but they wouldn't let me talk, even talk to a, a gastroenterologist friend as to what to do because that wasn't in the protocol. Mm. That is a problem. You know? That can be a huge problem. Yeah. I know. I anyway. Do, I would deal with it too. Yeah. Um, uh, no, I, touch wood, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty well. So the advice is you have to be a smart patient to, to find a good doctor. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Okay. Uh, or, or you have to have friends who, who know, or, or you, <clears throat> I'll, I'll never forget because I think it's, it answers your question. Um, I had to have cataract surgery. So I went to, um, oh, he, he was actually head of uh, BI at the time, administratively. Uh, we, were, we were friends. I, I knew a uh, number of people over there in the administration. Anyway, I went and asked uh, the, who, who would he suggest, and he said, "You know, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know." So what he did was to speak to the head nurse in the o operating room, and that's how I got my advice. <laughs> <laughs> the Go nurses <laughs> know what's going on and exactly. who is very so, good. You know, <laughs> those are the sort of ways I think you really find out and and, and obviously you, you go or if you want to ask physicians you should ask physicians who are in everyday practice because they know by the grapevine who's, who's good and there's other ones. Well in theory that's what Castle and Connolly does. Yes. It, <laughs> it doesn't. No, yeah exactly. No, no, well no. great. Uh, did I forget to ask you anything? I can't I imagine. Know. I don't I think I've been talking a lot. <laughs> you, you got well, I look. hope so. I hope so. <laughs> Would you like to add anything else? I, I, you know, what, what's, it, the, it, what's the most memorable I, thing about being here? And I, to me, it's your family. Yes. And uh, being family means we care about you. <laughs> and, and you still care about us. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it pains me when things happen that, that you know, take things away from the St. Luke's Roosevelt. Uh, family. Um, but I, 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 I think I've been extraordinarily lucky. You know, I came here as a very naive uh, house of, uh, Englishman to become a house officer. Incidentally, the first thing I was, as a resident, that I what, uh, they, the, the, the day I arrived, or the day after I arrived here, they put me in the emergency room. Oh, wow. So I learned quickly. <laughs> yes. In those days, you you were on. Uh, you had four hours. You'd be on sixteen hours at a yes. time. Yes. Yeah. And f eight hours in between, you could crash. You could, yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. So I, I learned quickly. <laughs> I learned the vernacular quickly. Right. Throw, anyway, throw it's, in I've the been, you know very fortunate to. Um, to have come to this country, to have come by chance, to have come to St. Luke's. I think that uh, St. Luke's was, was a, the, when I was a resident, was superb for me and to me. I was extraordinarily lucky to get to the Mass General with Curtis Lebrechen, where I could play. Uh, and I was very fortunate to be recruited back here. It was a lot of work. <laughs> um, I was you know, I did look at other jobs. Uh, the big, the most biggest job I looked at, and and I did parlay it here into something more, 
was I was actually offered the chief of GI um, at, um, uh, in Montreal at the Royal Victoria back in 65. Um, I, I decided not to go because um, I, t I knew that Canada and particularly um, Quebec was in, in flux at that time. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what they were going to do. And at minimum, what they did is they, they didn't, a lot of people left uh, uh, in the next four or five years. But anyway, but I was able to come back here and I got a guarantee of, actually got the guarantee of my salary um, here, as, or, or, you know, guaranteed by the institution and the, the quite, uh, for what was then a, a very large rise, raise, excuse me, <laughs> well, realistically not very much but <laughs> still by so, comparison uh, you know that was by comparison yeah so um, and then I, I looked at two or three other jobs but um, at chief of medicine jobs and I decided no I, I was I was happy in uh, quote unquote my little pond rather than I, that I needed to go up ladders for some reason. And I like New York. Uh, as I said, I'm a bit of, uh, I'm a city boy. So, yes, I've been very fortunate. And I've been fortunate and continue to be fortunate, even though some ups and downs after I left here, you know, bankruptcy and so on. But I, I got something else quickly and my relationship to Rockefeller and then on this, I believe, has been fantastic. So I have no, no, no complaints. <laughs> well, prevention of, uh, for colorectal cancer has been a <coughs> forefront now in the national media, too, because right, right, uh, right. people realize how important that is. And so you really made a um, huge impact yeah. uh, with the work that you've done. And I'm now really looking at uh, I, I, I was interested in obesity and colorectal cancer, and now I'm even more in, into obesity itself, and because uh, it's 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 probably the problem for the next uh, hundred years generation. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like um, so I'm really interested as to why we get complications in obesity and how we can reduce the complications because obesity doesn't kill you; it's the complications that kill you. Mm. So, that's so but that's it stems from becoming obese. Uh, well, why some people get, get, you know, some people can obese and are healthy and stay healthy uh, and others don't. And right. That's, that's a question we don't have the What's answer to. What's the difference? To, uh, yep. My name is Peter Holt. Um, my titles now are a Senior Research Associate at Rockefeller University. I'm um, Emeritus Professor of Medicine at Columbia University and um, adjunct professor of medicine at Weill Cornell um, University in New York. 